Hey everyone. So in this video I'd like to talk about finding areas under curves and uh, specifically using this, this method called the right endpoint approximation method. Um, so our, our main interest for this first part of the class is, is really to find areas bounded between uh, a curve, the graph of a, of, of a function, and the x-axis. Um, and, and so for some functions and for some graphs, uh, we can borrow ideas directly from geometry, right? We've sort of hinted at this in, in the introduction video. So uh, here I've got three examples, three functions, and you know, each one paired with an interval. And, and I want you to pause the video and see if you could find the area between the graph of these functions and, and the x-axis on the given interval. So pause the video and, and, and give this a try. Um, I think this, you know, it shouldn't be too, too bad. Uh, the, the last example might be one that, that might feel a little unfamiliar. Um, and I would encourage you to, to graph it out and, and, and you'll notice that it's a nice shape that you'll be able to find the area of. Okay, so you know, hopefully you've had a chance to try this out. Um, let's, let's do this together. So for this first function, this, this is a constant function. And so, you know, if I make a set of axes and I look at a y value of three, that's constant regardless of the value of x. And so this is, this is f of x. And maybe just for the sake of space, I'm just going to say that x is equal to, to negative 1 is right here, and x is equal to positive 6 is right here. And now we're just looking at the area under this curve, uh, between this curve and the x-axis. On this interval, well then the shape we get here is, is just a rectangle. Right? And so this is a rectangle with uh, a height of, of 3. Right, this dimension is three, three units, and then this dimension, this 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 other dimension down here, uh, goes from negative one to six. That's that's seven units. So the area is equal to three times seven, or twenty-one square units. That's that's this area here. Okay, uh, let's let's also do do g. Um, so g of x, you know, maybe it's a little bit more complicated of a function, but, but not by too, too much. Um, so this is, this is an absolute value function, and, and it's one that's you know, it's taking the, the very standard absolute value function, y is equal to the absolute value of x, and it's shifting it, right, two units. Right, so here... The graph looks something like this. And otherwise it looks like the line y is equal to x or y is equal to negative x. And so here this is also uh, two units high, that y-intercept. And, and we're looking at the area under the curve uh, on the interval from zero to to eight, and so we like let me just put eight out over here without sketching everything out, and so we're looking for for this area here. Actually, maybe I'll, I'll draw it a little further out just to make this a little bit more realistic. And say eight's maybe out here. And it's just a rough sketch. Okay, so we're trying to find this area Well here it's just the sum of, of two triangles, right? So if we find the area of the first triangle and the second triangle and we add those two together We'll have the area under the curve of, of this function g on this interval and, and so uh, You know notice that this is a side length of 2 and this is a side length of 2 for this left triangle and so this first area, maybe I'll call it A1. Uh, this is equal to one half times 
the base times the height of this triangle. So it should be 1 half 2 times 2. Or in other words, uh, just, just 2. And then what about this? the dimensions of this other triangle? Well, here this is a distance of 6. And if I were to plug in 8 into this function and get the, the height of this function, uh, 8 for x, well, I would get 8 minus 2 is 6. The absolute value of 6 is 6. This, this height here is also 6 units long. And so if I called this area 2, well then area 2 would be equal to 1 half times 6 times 6. In other words, well, 6 times 6 is 36, 1 half of that is, is 18. And so adding these two together, uh, we get a total area of 20 square units. <clears throat> okay, so for this last example, let's do some algebra just to really illustrate uh, what, what shape we get. Um, so maybe I'll sort of start uh, on the other end of things. So notice that, that the equation for a circle centered at the origin of radius 2 is x squared plus y squared is equal to 4. And if I try to solve this equation for y, isolate y, uh, I would subtract x from both sides, x, x squared, and I'll get y squared is equal to 4 minus x squared, which, which already looks very similar to what we had above. And then taking the square root of both sides, well, well for this to really be the same equation, I would need to take plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x squared. And, and so this, this equation here, like we said, it gives us a circle of radius 2. And, and if we were to only examine the positive part like we have above, right, we're not looking at y is equal to minus the square root of, of 4 minus x squared in, in our equation and our function above, uh, then we only get the upper half of this circle. We only get y values that are positive, none that are negative. And if we're trying to find the area under the, the curve of the square root of 4 minus x squared uh, on the interval from 0 to 2, then we're really looking at uh, this quarter circle here. And, and so we can use the idea that, that the area here um, is equal to well, pi times r squared over well, it's one fourth of the full circle. So, so that'll give us uh, well r squared in this case, or r is two, r squared is four. Uh, this just gives us pi. Okay, so you know a, a fairly friendly example, um, though the, the the function might have been a little foreign. Okay, uh, so most functions, you know. The most functions we've encountered so far uh, in our mathematical careers, you know, they're they're curved. They're not not they don't consist of straight lines typically, uh, and, and so really there aren't such nice formulas uh, to to borrow from or to use to compute areas. And so we have to take another approach. Um, so so really, you know, one example I want to use is is this function f of x is equal to x squared plus 1. If we look at this function here, and we wanted to find the area of this curve on under this curve, between the curve and the x-axis, on the interval from 0, x is equal to 0, to x is equal to 3, uh, we're looking at this area here. Unfortunately, I don't know any geometric formula that can help us out here. Right, so, um, 
So one thing we can do, and this is one thing we suggested before, is that we can we can approximate the area, and we can we can approximate this. Uh, at least the, the first way people usually try to approximate such an area is is using rectangles. Right? Um, and, and there's there's many ways to do this, um, and and I just want to illustrate one one approach in, in this video. And so maybe just for the sake of simplicity, you know, with this first example, let's let's approximate. The area using uh, three, three rectangles. And, and so the idea is that we're, we really want to split up this interval, right, from, from zero to three uh, into three rectangles of, of identical width. And just, this is really for the sake of simplicity, and later we'll want to come up with a, a formula uh, to to sort of reiterate this process, um, and so so here let's let's take our interval from zero to three. So split our interval into uh, three subintervals. Of equal length. And in this case, this is you know, fairly nice because our interval has, you know, it has a length of three, and so if we split it up into uh, three subintervals of, of identical uh, length, then then we just get, you know, one subinterval from from zero to one, another subinterval. Of, of one uh, unit length from one to two, and another one from two to three. Right, and and so this will give us you know one dimension of our three rectangles that we're going to use to approximate the area of of this uh, region. And and we'll use the function to give us a height for each of these rectangles. Right, so so here, um, maybe just to really illustrate this. I want to to use the function. Oops, sorry about that. To illustrate uh, the the height of each of these rectangles, and and really we can use any part of our function in each of the subintervals to to dictate a height. Um, and and one of the most common approaches is to use the right endpoint of each subinterval. To obtain the height of the rectangle. So here, if I look at this particular subinterval from zero to one, uh, one of the common approaches is to use the right endpoint of this interval, the function's value, the right endpoint of, of this subinterval, to determine the height of the rectangle. And then I look at the second subinterval, and again. Uh, just to be consistent, I'm going to again use the right endpoint of this subinterval, an x value of 2, to determine the height of this rectangle. I'm going to use the function's value at when x is equal to 2, the right end of this subinterval, to determine a height of one of the rectangles I'm going to use to approximate the area. And then again, I'm going to use. Uh, the right endpoint of my last subinterval to give us a third rectangle. Okay, and so there we go. We have we have three rectangles to use to to approximate the area. So here I should say use the function. to obtain a height for each rectangle. And in this case, uh, we use the function evaluated at the right end of each subinterval. 
Okay, and so, you know, what, what does this give us as an approximation? Maybe I'll scroll to the right here. What does this give us as an approximation? Well, here this is suggesting that the area under the curve is, is approximately uh, the sum of these three rectangles. So maybe I'll call this first rectangle the area here A1, A2, and the last one A3. What's the sum of these, these areas is our approximation. And, and in this case, it's uh, well, we see here that at the height of the first rectangle is two, so it's we get uh, two times one. Right, the the base of this rectangle has a dimension of one plus uh, what is this five times one plus ten times one. And and here maybe just to really make this explicit, uh, this. This two is, is the, the function's uh, height when x is equal to one. This is the function's height when x is equal to two. And this 10 is the function's height when x is equal to, to three. And this gives us, this gives us uh, 17. The area under this curve is approximately 17 square units. Um, so my first question here is, is, is this an overestimation or is this an underestimation of the area? Um, so pause the video, take a moment to think about this. So, so this is an overestimation, right? Because if we look at the, the area under the curve, it's, it's you know, what I'm shading here. And these rectangles, when we add up their areas, they give us all of the shaded region and then some, right? Here's all this excess that these rectangles are counting as well that we don't want to count. All right, so here this is really, uh, this is an overestimation. Okay, and, and, and so we give a name for this computation that we just did here. We call this, uh, we call this the, the right endpoint approximation of our area. And that's because we took, uh, you know, for each subinterval, we took the right endpoint to give us the height of each rectangle. And, and we usually dictate this, this example, since we use three rectangles, uh, we call it R three. Right here, this R is telling us this R is telling us right endpoints. We're using right endpoints to get heights. Evaluating our functions at the right endpoint of each subinterval, and this three is saying that we use three rectangles okay. So let me ask you to, to pause the video and actually do this computation uh, to, to, find, to find R6. So find, find R6. Right, so maybe before, before you pause and work this out, um, you know, we hinted at this idea that we'll get better and better approximations for our area the, with the more rectangles we use. And so if we compute R6, we'll get a better approximation. Um, and so please right, pause the video and compute R6. Okay, so uh, let's, let's look at our curve again. And, and again, this is, this is our function uh, f of x is equal to x squared plus one. And so, again, we're going to take our, our, our interval from 0 to 3. And we want to approximate, again, this area under the curve, between the curve and the x-axis, from 0 to 3. And so we're going to take, uh, if we're trying to find R6, we're trying to compute R6. This means we're, we're going to use six rectangles to approximate our area, and we're going to use, uh, we're going to split up our interval from 0 to 3 into six 
subintervals of equal length, and we're going to use the right endpoint of each of these subintervals to get a height of a rectangle. All right, so if I split up this interval from 0 to 3 into 6 uh, intervals, subintervals of identical length, then I get intervals like so. So I'm partitioning up my region into six regions here. And you notice that here this is this is one half, this is three halves, and this is five halves. And if we're going to compute uh, areas using R6, and we're going to take the right end of each interval to, to get the height of the rectangle. And so here, if I want to sketch out what this should look like, what rectangles we're going to use, I'm going to, for, for each subinterval, so this is the first subinterval, I'm going to use the function evaluated at 1 half to get the height, function evaluated at 1 to get the height of the second region, evaluated at 3 halves. This is the picture for the rectangles used to compute R6. R6. And, and what's the, the expression we would use to compute this? Well, this is equal to, uh, well, it's just f of 1 half times 1 half. Right, this, is, this is, if I were to give these areas names, so a1, a2, a3, three, a four, a five, a six, it's a little tiny, but hopefully you're still with me. Um, this f, f of one half times one half, this is the area of a one, right? F of one half is, is the height of this first rectangle and one half is the width of this rectangle. And we would add that width f of 1 times 1 half, because f of 1 is the height of the second rectangle, and 1 half is the width of that same rectangle, or that same second rectangle. But actually, all of these rectangles have the same width of 1 half. Oops. And so we would add this up with uh, expressions for all the other areas. Noting that this is an expression for a3, this is an expression for a4, for the fifth area, and for the sixth area. And, and we can go through the computation for, for all of these areas, um, but really, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of arithmetic and, and adding up fractions and counting fractions correctly. Um, maybe I'll just save us some, some trouble and save us some time. Uh, this gives us an area of 14.375. So it's you know a little bit less than 17, suggesting that you know we we uh, ought to go lower to, to get a better approximation. Um, and, and notice that this is a better approximation, right? Uh, our previous areas also counted uh, what I'm about to shade in, in orange. Right? Our previous areas for R3 also counted all of this excess in here, we're, we're leaving it out. We're getting a better approximation. Okay, and, and, and typically, um, you know, for, for most nice functions, uh, we, we do get better approximations as we use more and more rectangles. And this is actually how we end up defining what the area ought to be uh, for, for curved, shapes, for curved shapes. Really, in general, uh, the area of under the curve of, of some function between the curve and the x-axis over some, some interval, uh, it's really, I'm going to take 
my my region, my my area, my and, and split it up into n subintervals, and and compute uh, the right endpoint approximation under such a such a curve, and, and I'm going to take the limit of that as n goes to infinity. This is really what we define the area under the curve to be, if this limit exists, that is. And, and so uh, one thing I want to also say is that here we use the right endpoint of each subinterval. Um, we could have just as easily defined uh, or gone through an example using the left endpoints of each subinterval to compute heights of rectangles. Um, so let me also add that in here. Uh, so we use we use the symbol L sub n for for exactly that. This is the the left endpoint approximation uh, method for for the area under a curve using n subintervals. And and if we were to take the limit of that as n approaches infinity, we would also uh, get that. We should also get that same area. Um, so maybe just as a little bit of a of a uh, of practice. So, so we'll explore the left endpoint approximation method in, in the next video. Um, just one example and along with a, another example called the midpoint um, approximation method. But, but try and use this function, try and use this function uh, f of x is equal to x squared plus 1 to compute L3 and L6. Just for a little bit of practice. and, and uh, you should get, at least for L6, you should get uh, 9.875. Um, and I would encourage you to, to pause and, and uh, think about you know, what, what's sort of different in the computation between L6 and an R6. Okay, but we're not going to do that here. We'll talk about L6 in the next video. Um, and I guess one thing I want to show you to, to really illustrate this point, to really illustrate this point that... Uh, that the area really is the limit of this right endpoint approximation um, is to, to show you this, this illustration. So here uh, I've got this GeoGebra applet um, and, and I'll link this in, in Canvas. Uh, so here it, it illustrates the function x squared plus 1 uh, on the interval from 0 to 3 uh, and it, I, can, I can go through um, the right endpoint approximation method for a different number of rectangles. Right, so here this is for n is equal to 1, it's not really a great approximation, but it shows us that we get uh, an approximation of 30 square units. And if we, if we bring this up to n is equal to, to 3, oops, we get 17 like we saw, uh, as we saw earlier. If we bring this up to six, uh, we get 14.375. And if we really take this all the way out, uh, we can see that the areas get, uh, the, the overestimation gets smaller and smaller and smaller and less recognizable. As we let this go all the way out to, you know, some absurdly large number, it really does look like it forms precisely the area under the curve, between the curve and the x-axis. And, and, and we can see here that this suggests that the area ought to be 12 square units, right? When we take n to be 200, we're getting roughly a little bit more than 12. Um, and that ends up being the case. That ends up being the case. So in this case, the exact area is 12. And, and, and typically, we define the area to be the limit of, of this right endpoint approximation method with more and more rectangles. The limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, so let's let's illustrate uh, one more, one last idea, and, and really, uh, I just want to close out this video by by, by speaking in more generality to, to illustrate an example in more generality. So, uh, so right, we we just said that the area under the curve of of, of you know some function can be determined by taking the limit as n approaches infinity of R sub n, this right endpoint approximation method. Um, and you know, we could use ln, we could use other methods as well. Um, let's take a moment and, and build an expression. 
let's build an expression. that we can use to, to talk about this idea more, more generally. So if I have some arbitrary function, maybe I'll just draw the graph of such a function. That is so. And I want to find the area under this curve from x is equal to a all the way out to x is equal to b. Well, what would I do to write an expression for r and for some arbitrary value of n? Well, I would, I would partition. I would split up the interval from a to b. into n subintervals of identical length like we did be before. All right, so maybe just to, to really see this, um, this is an example where I'm splitting it up into uh, it looks like eight subintervals. You know, we could do more, but I think this is enough to really illustrate the picture. Um, and let's say this is x0, this last one's xn, and we've got all the x sub 1s, x sub 2s, x sub 3s, so on, uh, in between. And so we would split up our interval from a to b into n sub intervals of identical length. And, and here we've just labeled uh, these x values that sort of split up these sub intervals. Okay, well, well, what we need to do if we're going to compute some, some areas of rectangles is we need to figure out what this width is. We need to write an expression for what the width of each rectangle is. And, and conveniently for us, we've done this in such a way where each width ought to be equal to one another. Right, but the question here is, is what's, what's this width? And I'm going to call this with uh, delta x. And so pause the video and, and see if you can come up with an expression for delta x for this with delta x of, of any of these rectangles. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a moment. So the width delta x. And so how do we go about finding, finding the width delta x? We'll, we'll notice that, that you know, this interval from a to b What's the length of that interval? It's, well, this, this length is a. Oh, sorry, that length is b. This length is a, and the, the, the length from the distance from a to b here, this is given by b minus a. Right? b is the distance from b to the x or to the y-axis. a is the distance from a to the the y-axis, and and the difference is is the the length in between, the distance in between. And so that's the length of the interval. And if we're splitting this up into this interval up into n different subintervals, each of equal equal distance, uh, then the width here is going to be. Uh, well the length of the, the big interval divided up by n. That's what this, this width delta x is. Okay, and if we're going to compute rn, then we're going to use the right endpoint of each subinterval to, to dictate the height of each rectangle. So here I'm going to take the, the right endpoint, so x1, to give us this, this height. I'm going to take the right endpoint here to give us the height. Again, the right endpoint here to give us the height of this rectangle. The right endpoint to dictate another rectangle. And so we've got all these rectangles here.
Okay, and so this area, this area here, this 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 limit. n approaches infinity of r sub n well it's it's really the same thing as the limit as n approaches infinity of well the area of the first rectangle is given by uh, well the it's given by the height of the rectangle multiplied with the the width of the rectangle the width of the rectangle is delta x and the height of the rectangle we said was given by uh, the function evaluated at x1. Right, so this is f of x1. And so here this is this is the first area. Maybe I'll call it a1 like we've been doing so far. And we would have to add it with a second area. This is obtained by the, the height of the uh, the function above x2 multiplied with the width of the rectangle delta x plus f of x3 multiplied with the width plus, and we would do this all the way up until the very last one, f of xn multiplied with delta x. Right, so just to really drive this point home, this would be a n. We would add up all the areas in between. Oops should be a2. Okay, so so this idea here, um, this is you know, a pretty powerful one, and this is usually, it gets given the name, it gets given a name, this is called, uh, the sum here, it's called the Riemann, a Riemann sum. Whenever we're taking uh, whenever we arrive at a sum that's coming from partitioning some object up and then adding up some quantities related to that partition, um, we call that such such sum uh, a Riemann sum. And then we'll we'll see more examples of this throughout the course. Uh, maybe bef before we really end off this video, let me ask you: uh, How would this this Riemann sum look if we replaced R n? With, with ln. How how different would our sum look? Okay, so so that's all I want to say in this video. Uh, in the next video, we'll go through some more examples, and uh, yeah, and that's it. See you in the next one.